Turn your Bibles to Mark chapter 9. So we were in Psalm chapter 105. I dare you to read that at home, by the way. Anybody believe in building altars at home? Is there anybody who believes your home should be a revival home? Do I have any praying mamas who know how to build altars in their home? Come on, are there any Esthers in the house right now? Are there any Esthers online that know how to build an altar before the Lord? Come on, do we have some lionesses that know how to roar? <laughs> do we have any lionesses who know how to roar? who are not going to let shame and guilt and condemnation hold them back. Do we have any lionesses that know how to roar like their father, who's the lion of the tribe of Judah? Now let me ask some men, are there any men in the house, some lions who know how to roar like their papa, who know how to roar like their dad in this place? Am I the only demon slayer here? Is there somebody else pulling down strongholds? And <laughs> I'm trying to agitate you. Pastor Vlad, I'm going to shake them. I'm going to come down off the stage and start shaking people. I don't think they understand that you're in a destiny appointment. I don't think you understand this is not business as usual today. I'm feeling ornery. Y'all are not hillbilly enough to know what ornery means. I feel spiritually mischievous. I hate the devil. I hate sin. I hate what it does to you. I hate seeing people in bondage, strongholds in their mind. I've got an assignment from my master, the Holy Spirit. Can I fulfill that assignment today? All right, are you at Mark chapter nine? I gave the new people time to find it. That's what I was doing. All right, are you there? Mark chapter nine. I'm gonna start with verse 14. It says, and when they came to the disciples, they saw a great crowd around them and scribes arguing with them. Okay, now let me just stop right there. Wherever you see the ministry of Jesus, you're going to hear some arguments. Oh, listen, y'all ain't ready to be real with me today. You're going you're gonna to act like your friends don't discourage you from coming to church. Oh, listen, I hear the conversations in the spirit. I know some of your family. Oh, you go to Hungry Jen. Oh, you think that Jesus is really going to help you? Come on, I hear the conversations in the spirit. Your coworkers are like, oh, yeah, let me guess. God's going to work it out for you this time. Wherever the true spirit of Jesus is, there's going to be arguing around it. But you can keep your arguments. I'll take the power. <laughs> You can come on. Some of you are surrounded by religious folks that want to debate you theologically. You keep your theology. I want the power of God. You can take, come on. I'm not dismissing theology, but I'm talking about the doctrine of demons that have tried to put a stranglehold on the power of God while they're trying to figure it out in their head. I want to operate in the spirit. And the things of the spirit are foolishness to the car carnal minds. Some of your friends and family are like, you done lost your mind. Why don't you just go ahead and tell them I did. I exchanged it for the mind of Christ. I did lose my mind because when I was in my right mind, I was heavily medicated. When I was in my right mind, I was worrying all the time. When I was in my right mind, I was always full of fear. I did lose my mind. I lost my mind for the sake of Christ. Now I have the mind of Christ and it's not gonna make sense to you. It's a mind that operates in faith. Anybody. Anybody. And so what happens in Mark chapter 9, I just want to show you this, is when this crowd came and the disciples, you know, the, all this that was happening, there was this arguing. And then immediately, somebody say immediately. It says verse 15. All the crowd, when they saw him, were greatly amazed and they ran up to him and greeted him. And he asked them, what are you arguing about with them? And someone from the crowd answered him, teacher, I brought my son to you. For he's a spirit that makes him mute. And whenever it seizes him, it throws him down and he foams and grinds his teeth and becomes rigid. So I asked your disciples to cast it out and they were not able to do that. Let me just tell you this. Immediate obedience is always required. I, I would actually say delayed obedience is actually disobedience. Delayed obedience is actually disobedience. Because I don't know how much time you have. I don't know how much more grace there is on your life. All I know is you're hearing me right now, and I got you for no, Pastor Vlad for three hours. I got you for another three hours right now. I'm just teasing. Everybody got scared. The Presbyterians got scared. The Methodists got scared. But here's the thing, immediate obedience. I don't know who I came here for, but there's somebody 
that has been delaying their obedience to forgive. They've been delaying their obedience to surrender. They've been delaying their obedience. What I see in Mark chapter nine is this scene is unfolding around Jesus and they're really having an argument and there's all this stuff happening, but this boy just desperately needed freedom. And so Jesus answers in verse 19. He says, oh, faithless generation, how long am I to be with you? How long am I to bear with you? Bring this boy to me. And they brought the boy to him. And when the boy saw him immediately, somebody say immediately. See, there's something about that word immediately. We don't have a lot of time. I believe that God can do 15 years of what secular counseling says it can do in 15 seconds when the power of God begins to reorientate your mind, begins to go into your brain, physically change the structure of your mind. I believe that, that where there's not a surgery for it, the great physician can come in and say, this is a medically verifiable miracle immediately. Somebody say immediately. Immediately, it convulsed the boy and he fell on the ground and he rolled about foaming at the mouth. Now, for those of you who don't understand deliverance, can I tell you, not everything's a demon. But if you've gone to church 20 years of your life and never seen a demon cast out, I have to wonder whether Jesus was ever really there. Because wherever you see Jesus, you will see deliverance. Wherever you see Jesus, you will see the shouts of two things. One, demons coming out and two, the people of God celebrating. I love hearing those screams. There's two screams that we like to hear every time Jesus is in the room. Demons saying, why are you tormenting? And the children of God saying, I'm finally free. And immediately, immediately, immediately. And I will tell you this, sometimes Jesus prayed for the physical condition, but then sometimes Jesus, who was wise enough, he wasn't religious. See, at most churches, they'll tolerate you praying for a physical miracle, but they'll never let you deal with the spirit of infirmity. Yeah. Not everything is physical. Not everything's biological. Sometimes it's spiritual. It needs to be dealt with on the level that it needs to be dealt with. Matter of fact, I was giving these same verses just weeks ago, and I said, we are going to pray for the spirit of infirmity to actually be removed from someone's ears and all of a sudden, we had multiple ears open up. Matter of fact, this one woman, she, her, um, the quality of her hearing was decreasing every year. And the doctor said, you are, you are less than a year and a half away from being completely deaf. And, and actually, I want you to start to learn uh, um, American Sign Language now in preparation from being completely deaf. And all of a sudden, we cast out the spirit of infirmity, the spirit of deafness, See, in a lot of churches, it's like where we understand the, the secular wisdom of giving hearing aids, but what about the spiritual wisdom of casting out the spirit of infirmity? And so we begin to do that. This woman said it sounded like the volume knob got turned up on her ears. But you know what? I always encourage people, if you want to get medical verification, go ahead and do it. Just be a living testimony in the doctor's office. She went to an audiologist, and all of a sudden he said, down here is legally deaf, you were right above that. This line in the middle is normal, but this line is your new baseline, which is above normal. <laughs> Hallelujah. Above normal. How many of you know he didn't just heal and restore to the baseline of normal, exceedingly abundantly more than we can think, ask, or imagine? He didn't just heal. Come on, somebody. He makes all things new. If that wasn't enough, we had a woman who did at the same time receive a regenerative miracle where God, she was missing components in her inner ear and literally received healing and actually had a biological regenerative miracle happen. We've got it on film. You can watch it. Why do I have to say these things? There's an immediately. Somebody say immediately. I see this happening. Let me continue. And Jesus asked the father, of the boy, how long has this been happening in him? And he said, since his childhood, since his childhood. Spirits enter. It could have been a lifelong sentence. We don't know. But see, there are things that we deal with for years and years and years. There was a woman I met in the lobby, 15 years of unforgiveness. I will tell you this, rheumatoid arthritis, lower back pain, there are many physical connect connections to the spiritual root of unforgiveness. 
We're going to go through forgiveness. I'm allowing the Holy Spirit to give you enough time to discern who you need to forgive. Their faces are appearing before you right now. There's people from your past that you haven't thought about in years, and all of a sudden the Holy Spirit's saying, I'm going to bring you to a place of decision. It's time to forgive them as I have forgiven you. But there's going to be physical healings connected to that. I'm going to the root today. Can I go to the root? Can I go to the root? Can I go to the root? And then Jesus said to him, if you can, all things are possible for the one who believes. Somebody say all things. It says all things. It doesn't say some things. It says all things. My faith for you today is all diseases healed, all sicknesses healed, all demons out. That's where my faith is for you today. All things. Somebody say all things. And then verse 24 says, immediately, say, say it again, immediately, the father of the child cried out and said, I believe, help my unbelief. There is an atmosphere of the impartation of faith in this room right now, so that for those of you who couldn't believe, if, you're, if your heart will shift into saying, help my unbelief, I believe all things will be possible to you. Some of you have struggled saying, it'll never be me. I'll never be healed. I'll never be whole. Some of you have sat in services like this or watched online for weeks and weeks and watched other people get healed, and you've said, you know what? I'm always gonna live under this dark cloud. I'm always going to live in this place of desperation. I'm always going to hold this grudge. But I say by faith right now, the answer is no. Today's your last day. Today's your last day. Today, I said today is your last day. By faith, by faith, by faith, by faith. But I want to ask you something. Are you willing, just like this father for the boy, he put 100% of his complete and total trust in Jesus he didn't take his boy and say, let's medicate the boy. Let's take the boy to therapy. Let's take them to more doctors. He knew that the root of it was spiritual, and he knew that Jesus was the only one who could deal with it. There was a 100% reliance, and he said, help my unbelief. Right now in this room, and can I offend you all the way to your next level right now? Because I'm going to say some things that are going to offend you right into your next level instead of people pleasing you all the way down to mediocrity, Okay. Here's the thing, in most churches around America, we've emphasized confession without repentance. And pastors get up and they say, Romans chapter 10, verse 9, confess with your mouth, believe in your heart that he's Messiah. Listen, what happens in most churches is we confess we're sinners, but we've actually never repented of our sin. And what that means is in most churches, not this church, thank God, but in most churches around America, we just become very honest sinners. And we've never surrendered 100% to Jesus. We've held it in reserve. And we say things like, well, I'm struggling with pornography. You're not struggling with it. You just reduce the frequency of it to help alleviate your conscience. But it's grieving the Holy Spirit. And that's not repentance. Confession is, I'm a sinner. Repentance is sin no more. It's like, I will not surrender to that thing anymore because I want Jesus more. I understand that I cannot serve two masters. I will Will love the one and hate the other. And so I'm going to show my devotion to the lamb and I'm going to prove by my actions. Come on, somebody. Do you hear what I'm saying? But sometimes when you go back through the catalog of experiences in your life, you think about church camp, you think about revival. Many of you real, realize that you've only ever given 90% and you've kept things in reserve. You've, set, you've kept sexual perversion in reserve. You've kept, come on, this maybe it's in your pocket right now, counterfeit comfort, comforts, and you kept it in reserve. Maybe it's unforgiveness. Maybe it's unforgiveness. Maybe it's somebody that you've said, you know what, I just simply cannot forgive them. But let me tell you the thing about the gospel. The gospel is a hard word. The, matter of fact, the Bible says that there's this narrow, there's narrow road that very few will find. And so even though many of us are growing our churches, Jesus preached in such a way that would shrink it. <laughs> and so I'm not into crowds today. I want to know, are there any real ones in our midst? Are there any who say, I know it's hard. I know that this way is difficult, but I'm choosing the narrow path. I know there's going to have to be things I say no to. I know it's going to look peculiar. I know it's going to look weird to my coworkers. I know my family's not going to understand, but, I, but many are called, but few are chosen. I'm a royal priesthood. I've been designated by God. Is there any 
anybody here that understands there are some things that run through your family. Maybe you feel the pull to alcoholism. Maybe you feel the pull to perversion. There are things that run on your father's side. But in every family, there's someone who's chosen, like a Moses, to say, we can't stay in Egypt in bondage and slavery. And it may run in my family, but I'm where it runs out. I'm where it stops, and I don't care what the cost is. I'll sell it all. I'll give it all. I'm reckless, abandoned, no turning back. Is there anybody here who can help me shout to God? Bloodline curse breakers. Yes, we are saved by the grace of God, but there's got to be something attached to it. The fragrance, the aroma of faith. The aroma of faith. My, okay, some of you are looking at me saying, this guy doesn't know. He doesn't know what it's like to struggle. Let me just tell you, I was raised by a single mother on welfare in a trailer park. My biological father was a murderer, went to prison, came out of prison, and died prematurely. Then I, my mom married multiple abusive stepfathers who came into our home and systematically abused us sexually and physically. So when I talk about forgiveness, the gospel is not hard. It's impossible. Now let me go deeper. Because see, in most of our churches, we've preached the gospel in such a way where it's easy. The country club experience. You know, hey, just say this prayer and, and people are like, yeah, I feel better. I, I feel better. Because they're dealing within the soulish realm. But see, in order to function within the spiritual realm, the Bible says, for without faith, it is impossible to please God. And so the gospel is actually impossible, which means you have no power to actually be different than your father, different than your mother. You can't do it. And when you set up the gospel in most churches to look like Alcoholics Anonymous and everybody's just saying, yeah, I struggle too. And what happens is you end up creating these codependencies. Oh, I'm speaking into something. I'm speaking to something. It's getting quiet. Somebody knows I'm coming for their stronghold. You create these codependencies. Oh, me too. I struggle with gossip. Oh, yeah, me too. But here's the thing. The gospel is this. It's impossible. But here's the beautiful message. And I waited the whole time to say this. When you simply say yes by faith and you surrender everything and you say, God, I don't know how to be a good husband. I've never seen one. All I saw was men walk out. I don't know how to be a good husband to Julie. I don't know how to be a good father. All I saw was fathers who beat and with rage and with anger. Fathers who, I, that's, I, I don't know how to do it. I can't. I tried. I read every book. I tried, I tried the power of positive thinking. Come on, somebody. I, 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 I tried to motivate myself, but I, I come to the end of myself. It's got to be more than that. Because some of you just have this motivational Christianity. I'm not talking about motivational. I'm talking about miraculous. I'm talking about this is only going to be Jesus. What happens after this moment is going to prove that the gospel regenerates and takes somebody dead and makes them alive. It's not a gospel that makes somebody good better. It's the gospel that makes somebody dead come back to life and say, now I can be what I could never be before. Now I could forgive. Now I can do it. It's not just hard. It's impossible. But by faith, faith, somebody shout faith. Okay, so we have a few more moments. But most of you have never got to the place of full surrender. That's actually the problem. What do I mean by full surrender? Come on, the atmosphere is changing because I'm going to bring you into this right now. Full surrender is when you actually say, I am, for once and for all, I am going to forgive that person of the unforgivable. Because the Bible actually says that we shouldn't even continue to go and ask for forgiveness from God if there's unforgiveness against our brother. And you don't forgive that person because they deserve forgiveness. I'm not excusing their sin. You forgive them because you deserve to be free. You deserve to finally be free. And also you're acknowledging, I don't deserve the love and the forgiveness of the Father, so I'm becoming like him because I'm extending it to others. Right now in this atmosphere, this is, now you say, well, why did you bring up the e-cigarettes? Why did you bring up the physical healings? Why were we in Mark chapter 9? I'm going to tell you. 
because I didn't come today so that you would receive a healing. I came so that you would receive the healer. I didn't come today so that you would receive deliverance. I came so that you would receive the deliverer. Because when you receive Jesus, all those other things begin to happen. And so my question to you is, did you come to receive a healing? Or who wants Jesus, the healer? Did you come to receive a deliverance? But who wants Jesus, the deliverer? Are you hungry? Are you desiring more? Are you ready to press in? Does anybody feel it stirring in their gut right now? Am I provoking somebody? Somebody right now, just close your eyes and remove the distractions. Would you just, just, I want you to do this right there in your seat. I want you to think about your ex. (laughs) Have you forgiven? I want you to think about your mother. She was cold. She was callous and you needed her to be compassionate. I want you to think about your father. Have you forgiven your father? because he was inadequate. He didn't do right by you. We're not gonna go back and ask Jesus for forgiveness until we are willing to forgive those who have trespassed against us. This is the full gospel. Have you forgiven that teacher who told you that you were stupid or uttered a word, a spoken word curse over you? Can you forgive them? Can you forgive the person who told you that you were ugly and begin to say that? There's so many people in this room right now that have never been brought to this place of forgiveness, but this is where the power is about to flow from your life. Wow, there's many people weeping already. The Lord is starting to move. You can do it through the power of the Holy Spirit. Some of you have said even spoken word curses of I'll never be able to forgive, I'll never be able to release, but in this moment, your faith is rising and the Holy Spirit is empowering you to do it. Because what we're gonna do in a few moments, I just wanted you to remove the distractions. That's why I had you close your eyes. Because I want you to see the faces. The Holy Spirit will partner with me. There's some wives in this room that have saying, why is my husband so mean? Why is my husband so angry? You don't realize your husband is carrying 20, 30 years, 20, 30 years of trauma and pain, and he, he's never been able to release it. And he's taking it out on you and the kids because he has nowhere to release it. But today's the day. I said, today's the day. Come on, there's more. The Holy Spirit's revealing it to you. Some of you come from other churches. You've made this church your home. You love Hungry Gen, but you've never forgiven the pastor that wounded you. And how you exit is how you enter. And the Lord wants you to forgive. Yeah, they didn't see your potential. But the Bible says promotion doesn't come from man. It comes from the Lord. So it's time to release. It's time to forgive. I feel the fire of God on that for somebody. Right now, somebody in this room is forgiving themselves. You've never forgiven yourself. You were a little girl with all these plans, and you went the wrong direction, and you feel like you failed yourself, but the Lord says, forgive yourself because I forgive you. I'm breaking something right now. Chains are breaking. I hear them in the spirit. Chains are breaking. Chains are breaking. I didn't say this last service, but I feel that there's somebody, this is a, this is, um, was not on my radar. I just get in like a word of knowledge that there's somebody who spent a large sum of money in a way that they re- have regretted for a long time. I, I just getting that right now. And the Lord's saying, forgive, forgive, re- forgive yourself for that. I know that that one just right now, I feel like that was for somebody, like a large sum of money. Come on, let the Lord... I want to go a little bit deeper. If you were the victim of sexual abuse, molestation, rape, it's time to forgive. This is the gospel message. It can be nothing less than 100%. The Bible says we battle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers and rulers. But you've been fighting people, asking God to raise you up as a spiritual warrior. And I'm trying to get you to your promotion, but you got to stop fighting even those who hurt you. Hey, thanks for watching this video. If you enjoyed this content and this was a blessing to you, would you help us and hit thumbs up so that it could help more people to discover this video. It costs you nothing, but it can go a long way to help with the algorithm. As well as if you're not subscribed to our channel, hit subscribe, click on the bell so that you can be reminded each time that we upload videos. Thank you so much. 
for being a part of this community. If you're interested in learning more about Hungry Gen, our internship, our conferences, deliverance, and so many other things, go to HungryGen.com for more information. And as always, remember, better is not good enough, the best is yet to come.